we were made to worship, and we will worship something. If you're watching a, a football game or a basketball game, sometimes just turn off the sound and look at the, at the crowd there watching the game, and you'll see them going like this. They're lost in wonder, love, and praise, or, or a concert. You just turn it down. We were made for that. We have to do it. We were made to respond even physically and with wonder and joy and to be able to stand together in the presence of the one who has given us life and created us to respond to beauty and excellence and to be free in Christ to know this great God. I really am tempted just to say, uh, let's get our sister up to give her story one more time uh, because that's, that's it. That is the freedom that we're given in Christ and it is best told, not by preachers, but by simply those whom Christ has met and touched and set free. And those of us who claim to be Christ followers, children of God by grace, need to realize the power of our story and how many will be set free in times that we don't even realize it when we just speak a word of grace and are willing to speak of what the Lord has done for us. That's how the church grew. Freedom is our topic. And freedom is both something intuitively understood by every person because it's a longing of our hearts, and yet it's a hard thing to actually understand when it comes to putting freedom into action. And the reason, I think, is because we are, from birth, so very broken. We desire to be free in order not to have people holding us back and in order to, to go after the things that we desire. That's how we think of freedom. And so we want all sorts of layers of freedom, political freedom, economic freedom, and yet you can have all of that and wealth and education and opportunity, everything that this world offers and yet not be free. Uh, there was a powerful moment in an Academy Award winning movie way back when I was your age. And I don't mean to depress you, but just take a good look at me. I once looked like you. <laughs> That's why all of this is so important. This happens so fast. I, the other day I was driving and I pulled up to a light behind a minivan, most uncool thing in the world. And on the back of the minivan, there was a sticker that said, I used to be cool. <laughs> and, I, and I thought, I need to get one of those. I, I used to be cool. I used to look like you. And way back then, the, the book that we were all reading was Dr. Zhivago by Boris Pasternak, the great Russian writer. And it was made into an Academy Award winning movie, and there is a scene in that movie that I will never forget. It is on a train carrying people into Siberia, into exile. And these are people who'd been wealthy and successful and have now been displaced. And they are not bound. They're going where they're told. They're being very careful not to say anything wrong because they don't like what's happening, but they don't want to get in any worse trouble. There's one man on the train who is in chains. He's a prisoner. And he's lashing out and speaking the truth about what's happening to their country. And he's saying it to the guards and to the soldiers, and he's unafraid there in his chains to speak the truth. And finally, he looks around in disgust at all the free people on the train, and he says, I'm the only free man on this train. Freedom is hard to understand. And as our sister said, that 
moment when we look and say, in the words of the Bible, choose this day whom you will serve. Because in the end, every one of us must serve someone or something, some great vision, some great idea. The more free we are, the more responsibility comes with it, the greater burden it is. And finally, you begin looking in the mirror and see someone like me looking back, and you start thinking about your, your days fading away and death coming as it will come for each of us. And at the end of the day, we start looking at the great questions. What's the meaning of this? What is its significance? Either we've never succeeded at what we thought we would succeed at, and so we're disappointed, or you're very smart young people. You will probably succeed in your disciplines, and then you will face the disillusionment of realizing that it isn't enough to give your life meaning. And so we start asking the big questions and we turn to religion. Is there a God? What does this mean? Is there life beyond this life? And in religion, the very word in English means to bind. Religion, in the end, promises freedom, but it enslaves us. I was, I'm not I want to be careful telling this story, but, so I won't say where this happened, but a few years ago I was arrested because I was in a country with Christians who were not supposed to be meeting, and I was there when the authorities came, and so I was arrested, and in the process of a day and a half of interrogation, I, I made friends with the fellow who'd arrested me uh, because I kept joking with him, and finally he started laughing, and we started getting along. Um, and finally, he said, tell me about this religion. And I said, actually, it's not a religion. Uh, it's for those of us who are worn out by religion. Those of us who tried religion and it didn't work. It's gospel. It's good news that God has done for us what we cannot do. No matter how hard we try, all of our best religious efforts, we can't do it. And he has reconciled us to himself. And that's the good news of what he's done. And I talked to him about, his son, about the Son of God and tried to testify as our sister did in such a winsome way. So I want to just read you a text tonight, the verses that follow the ones that we looked at last night, and then to speak to you briefly about these and try to give you three exercises that you can do every day in order to begin to grow in your own experience of the freedom that is promised us in Christ. If you have the little sheet from last night, it's on the next page. If you didn't bring it, it's up on the screen. This is God's Word. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what's earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Put them away, he says. And then down in verse 12, he says, and put on, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, if anyone has a complaint, forgiving one another, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. I'll stop there. Paul tells us that if we are children of God, we have died, and our lives have now been united to the life of Christ. And he speaks that way throughout this letter and in most of his letters, he will talk like this. He once said about himself in writing to the Galatian church, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. 
Yet, not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. But it's easy for us who know these words and have learned them never to really try to think deeply into what they really mean. What does it mean to be united to Christ? We say it, but what does it mean? It's what Jesus prayed for us the night before he went to the cross. You can read his prayer in John 17. And he'd been praying for the disciples that were with him in the room. And then he said, Father, now I ask for all of those who will believe in me through their testimony. And he said, I pray that they may be one, just as we are one, as I am in you and you are in me, so may they be in me and I in them. I want them to know the same unity that we have. But what does that mean? Is it a mystery that we can begin to comprehend? Well, it goes beyond comprehension and explanation, but let me, let me use the illustration that the Bible uses, and that's the illustration of marriage. Why does Paul talk so much about sex? Why is he always getting after us about sex? Why does the, the Bible make such a big deal about sex? It's because, as the Bible says, and as the marriage service says, the union of a man and a woman, and especially the physical act of sexual union in marriage, is meant to be a picture, an illustration, a sacrament, if you will, in the true sense of a physical expression of a spiritual reality of our union with Christ. Forty-two years ago, when I was young and cool like you, I came back from overseas, got out of the service. I'd been in Southeast Asia for a year, and I'd been in the military for four years. Now I was out, I was free, I was ready to go back and continue my education. And I got married. I went and got married within 10 days of being back. Now, I'd known her for years before that, but, <laughs> but we'd been apart, and it wasn't the era where you could Skype or phone or any of that stuff. We'd been apart, just wrote letters. And now I was back. And the night before we got married, I said to my mother, I'm not sure I'm ready to give up my freedom. And my mother looked at me and said, freedom to do what? <laughs> and of course, there, therein is the mystery. Because every person wants someone who loves them and them alone and who's there for them and whom they can walk through life with. And they also want every attractive person they meet. We, we want the people we work with to like us and respect us. And when we tell them to do something, we want them to do it. You know, we, we want things that, that, are, that don't come together. And yet in marriage, in that union, I didn't just come to know my wife. I came for the first time in my life to begin to know myself. Because when we were joined together and two became one in the union of marriage, which is a picture of our marriage, our union with Christ, suddenly everything changed. I died to the person that I had been. I'd had an identity. I was cool. I was available. I was out there. I was ready to party. You, you tell me what's going on tonight. If it sounds good, I'll be there. That John Wood died, and thank God, it was a death that was desperately needed. And somebody new came to life, and that new person was someone who could love one person and give up his desires because 
Suddenly, I wanted to please her more than I wanted to please myself. And as that love grew, and as it continues all these years later to grow, it, it now, I, when, if, if Marianne dies before I do, though we are just a broken picture of my union with Christ, because in my union with Christ, I'm, I'm still a broken person, though He's healing me, but He's perfect. But in a marriage, you have two broken people, and yet if she dies before I die, it won't just be she who dies, but much of whom I am will die because of that union. And that's why the Bible makes such a big deal about sex. It's not because sex is bad, it's because it's so wonderful that God says, I want you to keep it for this place because when you are faithful in marriage, that becomes a picture of our relationship. And when you're unfaithful, instead it's a picture of people who aren't satisfied with God and run after other gods. Now, what does that have to do with freedom? The fact is what I feared would bind me ultimately set me free. And for me, not for everyone, singleness can be a beautiful path. It was the path of Jesus. It was the path of Paul. It's been the path of many great people. But those who do not marry still need the intimacy of community, of deep, loving friendships and people who will hold you accountable across the years and walk with you. Why am I saying this? Because when Paul says, don't you realize you've died, you've been raised to newness of life, if you are a Christian, you need to realize you are now in the deepest and truest sense married to Christ. And the person you once were who could just do what you wanted and make your decisions and chart your course and say, my mind is my own, my time is my own, my gifts are my own, can't do that anymore. And you say, well, that's not freedom. Let me tell you. I'm pushing on towards 70, gang, so at least give me credit for getting a little wisdom beaten into me. That is the path of freedom. That's the way of freedom. And that's why Paul in this text goes on and says, well, what's the first little exercise? The first little exercise is if you are seeking to know the Lord Jesus, if you have said to Him, I, I, I don't have it all figured out. This story seems to make sense of life and sense of my life. And I want to know you. I want to follow you. I want to serve you. Would you come? Send your spirit. Would you unite me to you? And I'll begin to walk this out. And just like in a marriage, you have to get to know each other. You have to spend time together. It takes time. Intimacy grows with time together. But that's where the freedom is found. And the first exercise, therefore, is to say, who am I? Did you hear what our sister from Mumbai said? The first question was the question of identity. Who am I? You no longer say, well, I'm who I was, except now I believe in Jesus. No, no. You say, I was once this person living out here. I was, truth be told, I was my own God because I was trying to be my own Lord and Master, and my world revolved around me. And the problem is, I, I don't make a very good God. But now I know the one true God in Christ. And my identity is that I am in Christ, a new creation. And therefore, as we saw last night, I find my fullness in Him. I find my forgiveness when I blow it or when I feel guilt and shame. I say, Lord Jesus, I can't undo this. You've already paid the perfect penalty. You've done what I cannot do. And I thank you again for that, and I claim it. And so your identity, your fullness, you find your freedom in Him that you have even had the power of death destroyed, and you will one day be raised up from the dead and live not in heaven. That's a big mistake Christians make. We think we're going to be spirits in heaven forever. That's not what the Bible teaches. Read Romans 8. We're going to be resurrected bodies in the new cosmos. God's going to make this world new again. He will not be put off what He started. 
And his aim is to have his people in glorified bodies like that of Jesus walking this earth. And the new Jerusalem will come down out of heaven as a bride adorned for her husband. We read in the Revelation, the city comes down. God makes his home with us. Intimacy there. That's your identity. If you're in Christ, you're now a citizen of that kingdom. Nobody can take that freedom from you. You are now a child of God, beloved of God. No one can take that from you. You now have a destiny that transcends time and space. It's eternal. And yet it will one day again, when this history has ground at last to its end, your life will just be beginning afresh. That's what Christ came to give you and me. That was the destiny broken by sin and rebellion, and it's restored in Christ. So every day, begin by saying, who am I really? I'm in Christ. Yes, I have this past. Yes, I have this brokenness. Yes, I see things in myself that I don't like, and I sometimes am tempted to say, can anyone love me? I have been loved by the King of kings and Lord of lords. He has loved me so much that he's redeemed me. Do you know how much he loves you? And your identity is found in that, that you don't have to wear yourself out trying to be good enough or strong enough or smart enough or religious enough. Do you know why Jesus was rejected? Because he wasn't, he wasn't religious enough. It was not the bad folk who cried out for his blood. It was the Presbyterian preachers. It was the scribes and Pharisees. It was all the religious guys who said, why is he always over there with the bad people? He's hanging out with the wild people, the party people. What's he doing with, he's supposed to be with us. And he said, that's who I've come for. I've come not for the healthy, but for the sick, not for the righteous. Because there aren't any, in truth, just people who think they are. I've come for sinners. And I thank God because I'm exhibit A of the kind of person Jesus came for. And that's my freedom. I don't have to keep wearing myself out trying to win his love any more than I have to wear myself out trying to win my wife's love. She gave it to me 42 years ago, and she's never withdrawn it. Even when she had every right to poison me or smother me in my sleep. I mean, <laughs> you know, I, when people say, I can't believe, did you read in the paper, that guy's wife killed him? And I always think, I've given my wife every reason to do the same to me. Thank you, Lord, that she's merciful. I don't have to earn her love. But as a result, I want to please her. I want to make her happy. And that's why Paul then goes on. And the other two things are simply, there is a truth to be remembered every day. And it's that you have a new identity. You are in Christ. You are loved by God. You are the Father's precious child. And you are united to his beloved. The second thing flows from it. And it's there's a death to die every day. But this isn't a bad death. It's a good death. There's a death, I told you, I had to die to be married. And often when I don't have my head on right, I have to die it again. Because I'll think, you know, why am I doing all the work around here? You know, she gets to stay home, I have to go to work. You know, it's my turn, I'm 66 years old, I'm old, I'm tired, I've worked long. You know, why, why am I doing this? Everybody else is sitting around the house. You know, you start and that leads to bondage. And then instead you say, what a load of, what's a word I can say at a Bridges conference? <laughs> well, probably isn't one. Uh, what a bad idea, that's not true. That's <laughs> that, and, and so you say, why, I don't wanna think like that anymore. That, put that to death. That's what, when he says, put to death all these things in you, he's saying all the stuff that once led you to bondage. And then he says, and put on, take on, and it's summarized by love. It's a call to a life of self-sacrificial love, which isn't painful, 
but it's joy. And that's why, and I don't mean to embarrass any of you, I know some of your cultures you don't talk about sex, but ours does and the Bible does. And that's why the physical act of sex in marriage is such a beautiful picture of our union with Christ. Because in that act, you give yourself away in love. You, to the degree that you find pleasure, it's to the degree that you are giving pleasure to your partner. And your desire is to think only of that one, and co which causes that one to think only of you. And the two of you in that act become one, giving yourselves away to each other in love. That's the gospel of Christ. It's a picture of it. That's why it's holy. That's why it's for marriage. Okay, one picture and I'm done. The confusing part of this for a lot of people and the language that Paul uses that causes people confusion often comes from his saying, set your mind on things above, not on things on earth. And you go, what's he talking about? I've got to go to school. I've got classes. I mean, am I not supposed to listen to the lecture? Am I supposed to be sitting around trying to imagine what heaven's like? I mean, what, what, what's this about? Or uh, he uses the same idea with different language in Romans 8 when he says, uh, you know, to set the mind on the flesh is death, to set the mind on the spirit is life. And people say, am I supposed to be sitting around thinking about Bible studies all the time? What, what is this? I can't live like that. No. You can think about and talk about sex, drugs, and rock and roll in a most heavenly spiritual way that is God-honoring. And you can go to Bible studies in church for all the wrong reasons in an earthly, fleshly way. I remember when I was in the service in the military, and some of the worst guys that I knew would get dressed on Sunday morning and go to church. I wasn't going to church in those days. And I'd say, what are you doing going to church? And they said, oh, it's the best place to meet women. <laughs> now, I mean, they were going to church, but it wasn't, they, their minds were not on heavenly things. What, so what does it mean? Okay, here's, here's what it means, and I'm going to embarrass some friends who are with me, but uh, the Douglases, Terry and Roseanne, are dear friends, and they love Bridges, and they've been supporters of Bridges for years. This is not their first rodeo. They've been to a lot of these conferences. A few years ago, my wife and I sat down to talk about our house that we've lived in for 25 years, raised our kids, grandkids now come, and I said, Marianne, it's time to downscale. I, I'm, you know, I love you. you. You've made a beautiful home. She's a great gardener. She has beautiful gardener, gardens. The problem is I'm her yard boy, so you know, I'm the one who's got to. But I said, it's time to downscale. The kids are, are gone. We don't need all this space. Let, let's just downscale, get a condo, or maybe just a little place with a little garden. And she said, and I said it sweetly. And, and she said very nicely, John, I, I understand, but this is the only real home I've ever had. My parents divorced when I was a kid. I lived in an apartment with my mom, but this is where I raised our kids. We moved and moved. Finally, we settled here. This is my home. And the grandkids come back here, and the kids come back here, and, and we all celebrate here. And she said, you travel so much, and when you're gone away, I just walk through here, and I hear the laughter in the walls. Don't, don't make me leave my home. So I said, great, okay. It wasn't but a month later that Terry and Roseanne called us up and said, we're having a bit of a disagreement. You're our pastor, so would you two come over and help us out as we think through this? So we went over, and they said, actually, we're trying to decide whether or not to, to sell our house. And Roseanne was saying, you know, I know to our friends it's not a big deal, big home uh, compared to what we could have, but I work with international students, and that's my heart. And when I bring internationals into our home, they kind of look around and go, oh, isn't this beautiful? And I feel like that's a bad testimony. I don't want them to think this is what I'm into. So I'm thinking we ought to sell it downscale. Terry said, well, I understand and I want to serve Roseanne, but this is where I, men come, and we have retreat, and this is where I gather with people and talk about the things of God. And, and I just said, you invited the wrong people to help you. <laughs> and they said, why? I said, we just had this discussion a month ago, but we didn't 
talk at all about the Lord or about this home really being His or, or how we would use it. You're, you're asking the right questions. Your mind is on heavenly things. Ours, even though we were very sweet and loving to each other, our minds were totally on the things of the earth. You see what, what he's talking about? It touches everything. It's why you do what you do, why you say what you say. And the freedom that we have is to begin to look at everything from that perspective. And when we do, everything takes on eternal meaning significance. We have been set free. In Christ we are free. And I pray that every one of you, those who know Jesus and those of you who don't yet know Him, will soon know the freedom of the children of God. Father, thank You. Thank You for such rich and glorious freedom. Thank You for uniting us to Jesus Christ in this intimate, loving union. And I pray that every person here will one day know what it means to be united in love with Christ, the great lover of our souls. In His name I pray, amen.